Hello everyone, Charles Watts here. Welcome to another edition of Inside Arsenal. It's Tuesday today. We are one day away from Arsenal, I was going to say, entering the uh, Carabao Cup, but they did actually enter it back, got a bye, didn't they? So they're, of course, in the third round tomorrow night against Brentford at the Brentford Stadium. Mikel Arteta will be speaking later today at London Colney, 3.30pm UK time. By the time you're watching this, he might well have already had his press conference, so we'll hear some more from him ahead of that game against Brentford, get the latest from him terms of some injury and team news, which we will talk about uh, in this show. We've got some questions and comments from you guys at the end, as always, as well. And just to remind you, I am recording soon with James Benj. We're doing Inside Arsenal Extra Time tonight. So that's going to be a longer episode, more in-depth. We'll talk about the derby, of course. We'll look ahead to this weekend against Bournemouth. Uh, and we'll certainly focus quite a bit on Ivan Tony as well. So I'm not really going to talk about Ivan Tony too much. I'm sure you've all seen the stories at the moment. He's all over the back pages today of uh, Mikel Arteta sort of stepping up his interest in Ivan Tony for a possible January um, move. So myself and James are really going to sort of get stuck into that in today's Inside Arsenal Extra Time. So if you've got any questions, comments, opinions on that or anything else you want to ask us, do let me know. Leave some comments below and I'll include some of them in the show a little bit later on today. I'm going to try and publish that probably around 5 or 6 p.m later tonight on Tuesday, so keep your eyes peeled for, uh, for that. OK, let's quickly get stuck in some other news then, shall we? Some good injury news for Arsenal. Like I said, Mikel Arteta will be speaking a little bit later on today at his press conference ahead of the Brentford game, so we'll hear what he has to say. But the word coming out of Arsenal is that Declan Rice's back injury is not too serious, which I think everyone can breathe a huge sigh of relief. Um, relief. Sorry, I think obviously the frustration of the result on Sunday has certainly sort of, I think, made a lot of people forget about Declan Rice's injury and how much of an impact that had. I'm convinced, had Declan Rice been on the pitch, that Arsenal wouldn't have drawn that game at the weekend. I think they would have all gone on and won that game. He's that important to Arsenal. And so, yeah, when the, there was talk about this back injury and it flaring up to such an extent that he could barely walk after the game or later on on Sunday night, um, that was all a little bit worrying. But good news coming out of Arsenal. Uh, sounds like it is not too serious. I can't imagine he will be involved against Brentford on Wednesday night, but slight possibility he could be involved against Bournemouth. But when you look further ahead the following week to Manchester City, I think, you know, there is a lot of confidence that he will be fine and available for that, which is going to be big, big news for Arsenal. Uh, Leandro Trossard as well. Um, and Gabriel Martinelli, it sounds like those two could well be involved in that Manchester City game as well, which is good news. Not totally ruled out the Bournemouth game at the weekend. Um, and from what I understand... Thomas Partey is ahead of schedule and it's likely, fingers crossed, that he could well come back sooner than expected. Now, the timeline for Partey was after the international break. But as far as I'm aware, there is confidence uh, that he could well be involved before that international break. And so that could well mean Manchester City as well, which would be a big, big boost to Arsenal. Of course, Arsenal started with Partey and with... Um, Rice in that Community Shield game, didn't they? Didn't they at Wembley at the start of the season with those two in midfield? And I think if they're both fit and available, that could be a real option for that Manchester City game as well. So certainly good news that on Thomas Partey. Um, we'll see how that continues to progress over the next sort of week or so. But if he can get back to training by the start of next week, um, then you would think that Manchester City is a very realistic proposition, uh, sorry, um, a possibility ahead of uh, his return, which would be a big, big boost. And Trossard and Martinelli, if those two are available, that'd be great. And Declan Rice, as I said, sounds like he will be fit as well. And the injury is nowhere near as bad as there were some fears that it could have been after the game at the weekend. So good news on the injury front, um, which is a bonus because I think we're all a little bit sort of worried, weren't we, when we came away from the game at the weekend with all the injuries that were beginning to bite. OK, let's look ahead to the Brentford game then, shall we? Now, I think we're going to see widespread changes for Mikel Arteta for this one. I can't imagine he's going to go too strong, especially with the injury issues that are going on and they're impacting the squad. Uh, even Bakara Saka, who we haven't spoke about yet, limped off in injury time against Spurs, was clearly really, really struggling, couldn't finish that game. So you think he's going to get a night off from this one as well. And there'll be some big changes in terms of who could come in 
um, for the game. You're looking at Tommy Asu, I think, you know, he's a certain starter, Kivy or, you know, even Cedric Suarez, those sort of players that you can change at the back. I mean, I'm sure Aaron Ramsdale, we're going to speak about a little bit later on in this video. I'm sure Aaron Ramsdale will come back in goal as well. You've got Mohamed Elneny, who is fit, was on the bench for the first time against Tottenham at the weekend following his injuries that he's gone through. You know, could he come in and get his first minutes of the season? Potentially so. Jorginho, uh, who will be looking to bounce back from the mistake against Tottenham. I think Jorginho will certainly play. Reese Nelson, Eddie Nketiah possibly might be the only player I would expect who started against Spurs, who could well start again on Wednesday night. And Nketiah again, sort of with a few uh, questions to answer, really, in terms of getting back to somewhere near his best. And, um, you know, I think Mikel will take this seriously. It is a trophy, but I do expect he's going to make changes. He's got to. You know, players have got to get minutes. Emil Smith-Rowe, you know, I'd love Emil to start this game. I really, really hope he does. Um, I mean, Kai Havertz might even start this game, to be honest, given he didn't start against Tottenham. And Mikel will be desperate for him to have a moment to score a goal, to get an assist sooner rather than later, just to get himself up and running. So he might give him another opportunity in this game. But I'd love to see Emil Smith-Rowe start. I think everyone would. It's clear the fans want to see more of Emil Smith-Rowe. He's got the last few minutes against Tottenham, but it'd be great to see him get his start and really give him an opportunity to start putting pressure on those ahead of him in the lineup. You know, Mikel's talked at length about giving players minutes and how he feels bad about not giving them minutes and things like that. And they deserve to play more. Well, this is the opportunity these sort of games, let them play, give them the opportunity to impress. And if they do impress, then give them more opportunities in the Premier League. And um, so there's plenty of them. Well, I've been getting lots of questions, you know, who do you think any youngsters will be involved? And they, they could be from Manieri, you know, sorry, Raul Walters, someone like that, Miles Lewis Skelly, Mario uh, Cozy Dubri, Lionel Souza, those sort of players potentially could well fill a subs bench. I imagine it's going to be a pretty young subs bench. Um, you know, and we could see some youngsters involved. I think, you know, that a lot of them are pushing and getting close. A lot of them are getting a lot of opportunities when it comes to training and the minutes that they're getting in training. And this could be a good opportunity for them as well to get some minutes. Even Manieri, of course, made his debut. So famously at Brentford in the Premier League last season, it'd be quite fitting if he got his second appearance back at Brentford. Again, he's had a good start to the season for the 21s. Scored a few goals. Looks promising. Walters, as I've spoken about a lot of times on this channel, is very, very popular at Arsenal. He's well thought of. Mikel Arteta likes him. Um, given, you know, if, maybe if you've got Tommy Asu as left back, you could play Walters at right back. You could start him against Brentford. So that's one certainly to keep an eye out, I think. But let me know what you guys think. Who would you be starting? How would you be approaching this game against Brentford? Would you like to see Mikel go pretty strong because it's a trophy that's on offer, the first trophy of the season? Or do you think he needs to make a lot of changes, give players a rest, give up opportunities to the likes of Smith Rowe, Nelson, players like that who I've mentioned, or some of the youngsters who, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see on the screen at the moment. Let me know, as always, please do in the comments below. OK, before I get to a few of your comments, I just wanted to touch on it. I almost didn't want to talk about it because it was such rubbish, but I just I feel quite strongly about it. Jamie Carragher's comments at the weekend, sort of having a go at Ramsdale or, or mocking Ramsdale almost for applauding David Raya's save at the weekend. Um, I just thought it was so out of order and just, you know, you almost there's lots of criticism going on about the Arsenal goalkeeper situation and all that and people are looking at it and focusing on it and, you know, to almost suggest that a player is doing that, not because he wants to do it, but because he knows the cameras are on him. I just think it's really, really out of order, even if it was a kind of jokey comment. If you didn't see it or hear it, Carragher said when the cameras showed Ramsdale sort of applauding um, David Raya's save again from Brendan Johnson, that it, Carragher said something that was like, it's like something you see at the Oscars when someone who hasn't won the Oscar is the camera flicks to them and they start sort of, applaud him because they have to but really they don't want to and that's what he was saying for Aaron Ramsdale and it just really annoyed me I just it was really out of order because A he has no idea if that is the case at all and I'm sure it's not and you know Aaron Ramsdale's taken to social media these clearly if you're watching YouTube you can see these pictures they're clearly um, in response to that he's posted a picture of him celebrating um, the one on the left is Mark Travers when he was at Bournemouth for Ramsdale he was competing with Travers for the first for the number one spot and Travers made three penalty saves in a League Cup game. Um, and the video and the picture here is Ramsdale coming charging out to celebrate with Travers for making those saves, even though he was competing for him for number one. And so there's a clear response here from Ramsdale to Carragher's comments. And the other one's him obviously celebrating Reese Nelson's goal and just showing how he just loves to celebrate whether he's on the pitch or off it. That's just the type of player he is. And you know, I just thought Carragher, it was just really 
a stupid comment. It really, really was. And not for the first time, the pair of them, him and him and Gary Neville, it seems like you're come constantly bringing up what some of the stuff that they're saying. But yeah, I thought that was really, really stupid. And I saw someone, I'm not sure who it was, I think it was a former Bournemouth player sort of standing up again for Ramsdale on um on social media and mentioning this Mark Travers incident saying it's just the type of player he is. You know, I've played with Ramsdale and this is the type of player he is. And you know, Carragher just doesn't really just doesn't have a clue. Even Aaron Ramsdale's dad, I think, took took to social media to have a go at it. So I think some of these pundits and commentators they really do need to think before they uh before they talk about some of the stuff that they do okay quickly before i move on and uh end today's episode some comments and questions for you there's lots of them here so i've bunched these ones together in response to the weekend and the reaction to it gunner coop says charles we can't keep conceding two goals at home it's as simple as that we're starting to give away two goals at home in the middle of last season it doesn't look like stopping this year Rye doesn't look like an upgrade on me uh trams on me and eddie playing 90 minutes in big games is going to work um Manda Lubica says it's fine margins in football. Two errors and four points dropped. One in Fulham from the corner, one in Spurs. Without these two errors, we'd be also be top. The selection issues wouldn't be a matter. Charlie says post Morton since Spurs seems to be all about our need for a striker. While I agree we can upgrade Jesus and Nketiah, the main issue is our defending at home. Six goals in four home games, not good enough. This isn't new either. Last season, we conceded far too many goals at home. That's the immediate issue that needs to be resolved. Players seem to be more switched on and focused away from home. So I'll bunch these all together because it's all very much the same. It's talking about errors and silly mistakes at the back. And that's what's costing Arsenal. And it is, you know, I spoke a lot about um, how I do think Arsenal need another option as a forward this season. But as I've said many times, they've just got to cut out doing stupid things at home. You know, they haven't conceded away from home this season in the league. Yet at home, they're conceding all over the place. They're just making these silly, silly errors. And although they weren't great at the weekend, they comfortably win that game if you don't just make silly errors at the back like they did and give goals away. And they've got to stop doing it. It's really, really vital that they do it because they can't keep seeing, you know, you score two goals at home against Tottenham, you should win that game, end of. But if you're going to concede two, you're not going to. And if you're going to, you know, concede two against Fulham, Two against Tottenham. You've got Man City coming up. You know, you've just got to be so switched on at the back. You cannot keep giving goals away at home, especially totally avoidable goals. It's really, really important. So as everyone says here, you know, obviously I can understand, and I spoke about it at length yesterday, how a striker is, you know, it, it needs to be in the conversation in terms of moving Arsenal forward and giving Mikel Arteta another sort of option off the bench or from the start that he can have up front. But at the back, defensively, just stop doing silly things because it's mad. I look at some of the performances from the defenders at, in these games. Like I thought Saliba was brilliant against Spurs. I thought Gabriel was great as well. And I thought they were against Fulham. They played really well. But there's st it's still two goals being conceded because around them, silly mistakes that they can't deal with because the mistakes have been made, individual errors, are just costing Arsenal. And it's, um, it's something they've absolutely got to sort out. Here's one from John who says, with all our injuries, it's time for our depth players to stand up and be counted. Mikel said as much in his press conference after the match. If they step, don't step up and perform, then we'll slide down the table. As for challenging for the title, so Liverpool, Spurs and Brighton, plus we have teams behind us that are growing in confidence. We really need to stop taking our foot off the gas when we have a goal or two. Look at what Newcastle did at the weekend. That is what we should be aiming to do in every match like City do. I'm not sure you can be aiming to score eight goals in every match, but I, I absolutely get your point there. Although City, to be fair, after they went down to 10 men, against um, whoever it was at the weekend. For Forest, wasn't it? That was, I was quite surprised at how they sat back in that game um, for basically the whole of the, the second half. But what City are doing at the moment, which Arsenal aren't doing, is they are keeping clean sheets. They are not conceding. Since Pep made that switch tactically uh, during the sort of second half of last season, basically started playing with four centre-backs at times, they've really, really s stopped leaking goals. And when you do that, when you've got the quality they've got going forward, they're always going to keep winning, which is what they're doing at the moment. And that's what Arsenal aren't doing because they're conceding silly goals and they're dropping points to Fulham and Tottenham, which they should never be dropping, given they scored two goals themselves at home. Here's one from the sexy lady. It says, meltdown by Arsenal fans yet again. I'm a lifelong gooner. As far as I'm concerned, this had nothing to do with Arteta. We missed clear-cut chances that would have changed the game. Eddie and Jesus um, suggests there we had injuries and therefore players on the pitch that... Um, would not have had those players. Jorginho and Havertz were shocking. Arteta made subs that did not do much better. Explain what Arteta did wrong. Only thing I can think of was rather have it on any midfield than Havertz or Jorginho, but that is hindsight. I don't I'd, I'd have had, I don't think, you're always going to bring Jorginho on in that situation. Yes, he made a mistake, but Jorginho, they're absolutely the player you should be bringing on in that in that situation with Declan Rice injured. So that wasn't a mistake. My, my issue with it was that I just felt that moving Jesus out wide, I just didn't like. I said that yesterday. I think he played Nelson... If you're not going to play Nelson when 
Trossard and Martinelli are injured, then when are you going to play him? It just doesn't make much sense to me, especially when he's putting some good performances off the bench. So that was the one big error I thought that Mikel Arteta made was um, uh, was not starting with Nelson on the left and having Jesus as a central striker, especially after Jesus had played so well as a striker in the game against PSV. But um, yeah, I mean, the reaction is surprise. I want to say surprise me, but it hasn't because I know what it's like after every single game you drop points and now it's so... Brutal. I mean, some of the stuff I was seeing on social media in terms of the performance and the result and what it means and Arteta, I just like, oh my God, it's a draw. It's like, it's mad. It's like I've grown up in a world where a draw is not the worst thing in the world. But obviously Man City and the points they get now and the wins that they get has changed all that. It's like any draw feels like a defeat, but it's a North London derby. It doesn't matter who's who, who's bad and who's not. You know, when Arsenal were at their very best and Tottenham were at their very worst, there'd still be North London derbies that would draw because that's the type of game it is. You can't always win derby matches. That's what makes derbies so great. Um, and so I don't think it's some absolute disaster. It's frustrating, yes, but some of the reaction, just like, it's just, I don't know if I'm just getting old or what, but I just take a step back and think, I, I, it's so over the top. It feels so over the top to me, especially when, you know, if Arsenal don't make stupid errors like they did, if Jorginho doesn't give the ball away, Arsenal go on and win that game anyway, even if they weren't at their best. So, But hey, that's just me. And I understand that we're living in a very different world now and a very different uh, type of sort of media world when it comes to reaction to football matches. All right, that's it from me, everyone. Thank you very much for watching. Like I said, keep your eyes peeled for Inside Arsenal. Extra time later today with myself and James Bench. If you want to get involved in that, then please do leave a comment below this video and I'll go through some of them and include them when we do record in a little bit of time. Have a great day, everyone. Speak to you soon.